continue to lip read. But we're here together and uh, I'm really excited about today because the topic um, is something I could definitely relate to. And the topic is the Rosolimo, Sicilian Rosolimo. So it's a way of dealing with the Sicilian, uh, specifically the 96 Sicilian. So I'm excited to take a look at that. And also, I felt brave enough to add one of my own games. And it's a game that I rarely remember. Um, it was one from 2017, the African Championship that I played. Uh, good afternoon, Cappy. Good to see you. And uh, yeah, so hopefully we won't have one of those wars that we had previously, YouTube versus uh, Twitch. <laughs> uh <-huh. clears throat> Alrighty. Okay, so the Rosalimo, like I mentioned, and I'll show you the first couple of moves and we'll just kind of stop there. Um, here we go. We'll stop in this very position for a second. Um, the first game I want to take a look at was uh, Bobby Fischer, Robert James Fischer versus Boris Spassky. And this game took place in 1992. Um, I don't really know the tournament, but um, it, there was a whole article written about it. And somehow the whole game didn't load. But what I'm going to do is kind of use references um, at some stage. So I might not be able to see the chat most of the time but that's all right um all righty so let's let's begin with this game and as we know uh there was a a rivalry between the whole america versus russia um in 1972 um Bobby Fischer played Boris Spassky in the World Championship match. And I don't think this was a World Championship match because maybe 1972 was the the only uh, match that, that Bobby played in and then decided to just disappear and like claim his throne and say forever he will be this world champion. And anyway, 1992, they played again in a tournament and uh, there's a bunch of comments and I, I really like the annotations or games with annotations because it helps us better understand a game. Um, so let's go ahead. So we're at e4. Let's go back as well. e4, c5. e4, c5. Hi, didn't realize you're also in Twitch. Yes, Cappy. Just passing through, Jess. Awesome porn watch destroyer. Great to have you here. At least I have no uh, banning powers, so you don't have to worry about that. e4, c5 is uh, characterized as the Sicilian. White plays knight f3, and uh, black plays. Knight c6 here. You will stay, PMD. <laughs> you won't do that today. Hi, Indrano. Knight c6 and bishop b5. And now we see the Rosolimo. Rosolimo um, was named after a human being, actually. Let's see if we can find his name. Uh, Rosolimo... Nicholas Rosolimo. Nicholas Rosolimo was a Russian-born chess player after acquiring a Greek citizenship in 1929. He was able to emigrate that year to France and was many times chess champion of Paris. In 1952, he emigrated to the United States and won the 19 1955 US Open Chess Championship. Amazing. Amazing. So he was born, whoa, he was born on the 28th of February. Nineteen <laughs> ten. And had a had a full life there. Alrighty. It's evening in India. It's half past six. Six thirty PM in India, right? Sounds Italian. Uh Greek? Is it okay. Never mind. So over here, g6 is uh, the regular response to the Rosolimo. There's also a6, I believe, is a move. d6, less commonly played, I believe. Um, so here I'm going to start reading the annotations, which I really, really like. This is probably the best move against the Rosolimo. You will see, you'll also see e6 and a6. Ah, e6, okay. e6 and a6, 
but I don't have the knowledge to go deep into either line. Both are playable, but I would suggest that G6 is better from what I read and the games that I have seen. Not many GM games that I could find. Okay. So this was obviously the person who wrote the article saying these things. Bishop takes C6. Rushing into it. Rushing into it. I like the confidence. It's like, you know, bishops are better in the end game, but you know what? Never mind, because, well, let's just go ahead and, and, and take the knight and cause the stru structural weaknesses because we're going to win in the middle game, which is basically what Bobby is saying over there. Sus? No, you. <laughs> okay. So bishop takes e6. Uh, this is a good move by Bobby Fisher. Fans of the bishop pair among them, Kromnik, <laughs> have been surprised that this worked out so well for white. Okay. And b takes c6. So here we already see the reason um, why white decided to go for this is to just create this kind of problem for black, the double pawns on the c file. And, of course, the isolated pawn on the A-file. Okay, castles and bishop g7. Rookie one. Normal stuff, something I've played as well. I've decided to leave the game that I've chosen for my own uh, database uh, for much later. Otherwise, I will probably show you next. But there's also a joke that I wanted to show you that I found really funny. I was like, <laughs> well thought out. Hi, Rohit and Shivam. I just started. I just started. G6 doesn't allow white to fianchet, fianchetto himself. So it's very good from that perspective. Well, I suppose. But white doesn't really want to fianchetto the C1 bishop, I think. Um, maybe his idea here instead is to play something like C4 um, to kind of stop the double pawns. From moving forward, or maybe even c3 to lock down their fianchetted bishop. Okay, rookie one, and this is to support the e5 push. Okay, to stop the bishop. e5, then black plays e5 himself, and b4. This move I did not expect, but at least they've explained it. They've explained it. What about knight h6 for black? Uh, knight h6 is actually played um, in the game. Knight h6 is played, but we'll see what happens. Um, that is actually where the game stopped. I know white won this game, so Bobby did win this game against Boris Baski. Okay. Mm, give me a moment. Maybe I can find the full game. Mm -mm -mm. There we go, I found it. already so here we have b4 on the board this puts a gambit to black this puts a gambit to black okay it looks to post the bishop on the b2 square which is what pawn march destroyer actually said giving him a strong attacking bishop on the future home of an of the king on the king of the king probably of the king here um, yeah, so the future home of the king is on the king's side. Very well put there. This move also directly and indirectly threatens to win material. It attacks the pawn on e5. On e5. Okay. And that indirectly pressures the bishop on g7. All right, so b4 threatens bishop b2. And that move is so powerful, you're already seeing it as a threat. Which is great. Hi, Kelvin. You did not miss much. We just started. All right, b4, and c takes b4, a3. You didn't take it. 
and take some b4, take some b4. And we're just seeing a lot of pawn moves here for black. We're not really seeing a lot of moves that develop. And already we can count how many developing moves white has made compared to the developing moves black has made. So let's start with black. Black has played bishop g7. The rest of the moves are all pawn moves and we don't count those as developing moves. So let's take a look at white. Excuse me. We have knight f3. Castling is a developing move. Yes. And also rook e1, activating the rook on the e-file, which we're going to consider developing move two. So three moves versus one move and it's white's move and they can add a developing move here so there'll be quite a few up worth um the pawn sacrifice or the gambit d4 e takes d4 and bishop b2 bobby fisher just doesn't care about material here bishop b2 threatening the pawn and um materially or materialistically he's down two pawns but if you look at the position he's bound to get at least one pawn back immediately and another later on but there's already so much pressure on the e-file rook a1 we'll count this as well very good well spotted ernesto so rook a1 is also developed putting pressure on a7 and that rook is kind of tied down to a8 well spotted Well spotted. I'm over a Twitch streamer, by the way. Alrighty. So bishop b2 and d6. Knight takes d4, getting one pawn back. So d6 is a problem for black b4 is a problem for black and that king is definitely a problem okay so that's where it stops for me we'll see what happens here so black plays queen d7 and then knight d2 and bishop b7 bishop b7 and this apparently is an inaccuracy made by boris spassky and it says probably a mistake this loses time developing the bishop when knight e7 probably is better this is so that black can castle and gain some of the tempo back all right so the tempo he's behind right now if we look um, again, at the developing moves, we see the queen d7 is developing move. The bishops, so that's three. For black, the king is looking very uh, weak right now. And then we'll look at white. One, two, three pieces developed. The rook on e1, four. The king is safe, five. And the rook on a1, as mentioned by Ernesto, is six. So one, two, three, four, five, six versus three so weiss is doing really really well and still only a pawn down with some weaknesses to target i like white's position me too okay bishop b7 and then we move on knight c4 very nice move now the queen is putting pressure on d6 never mind the knight in between them and the knight is putting pressure on d6 as well how should black react to the rosa limo um I will show you, um, actually I played a game in African Championship and World Championship with uh, Rosalimo, but on the on the losing side of it I played with the black pieces uh, with the knight h6 line, but I think the best way for black to react is just to get the king safe as, as soon as possible. And I think playing uh, with black pieces in general, the idea is to, um, because you are moved behind, constantly white is always uh, making the first move right what you have to do um <laughs> what you have to do is just um right get the king safe try to equalize and then you fight for an advantage if you fight for an advantage right from the beginning it's not going to work out very well for you 
because you're always on the back foot and you're fighting for an advantage where there is no advantage uh, in the beginning of the game and you'd have to equalize first. So black is always trying to find a way to equalize over here. It's not so great because um, the blacking is, is not safe at all and that puts him on the back foot once again. Hey screws, no problem. Semi. <laughs> okay, so we have knight c4 on the board and knight h6. And this is the move you guys were mentioning as well. Knight h6, a way to develop. Um, so probably the the what we have um, after knight f6 is just blocking the bishop. And that bishop is doing a lot on this diagonal, seeing that the knight on d4 cannot move. If the knight on d4 uh, could move, it would be maybe a little bit worse for black because then the pawn on d6 would be hanging. It's only that the bishop is pinning the, the white uh, bishop on b2, so the knight can't move at all. After we defend b2, I guess. Yeah. Knight b5 is a brilliant threat. I like that. Queen takes and knight takes d6, winning the queen. Very nice. I discarded this move after I saw queen was attacking, so I must have looked a little bit... I must look a little bit uh, deeper next time. I agree, Calvin. Black should have moved the knight in castle. Knight e7, yeah. Exactly. Okay, so what move do you think white made here. So we're going to stop and we're going to take a look and I want you to tell me um, some possible moves here for for white and it's I can tell you now it is not what you're thinking. It is not what you're thinking. Take your time. Grounded now probably. <laughs> is that all you guys think I do? Ground people. Fair enough. Queen d2 is interesting. Uh, PMD. Hi to all of you who just joined us. Okay, so the reason I stopped here and the reason I usually stop in a position where it's in the middle of a game is because I want you to find a move that is like, wow a nice tactical resource and when I refer to tactics I want you to focus on forceful moves and what are those forceful moves we've discussed them before checks captures attacking moves there are no, there are no checks here that really work other than knight takes d6 but knight takes d6 is uh, a little bit dubious we we want to avoid that so I can tell you that's not the move captures that's probably the only capture that exists other than rook takes a7, which is just blundering the rook. Um, so let's look at attacking moves here. Some very, very intense moves. You like knight b5? Knight b5 is interesting. There is something slightly better. It's only um, over here, I think, knight b5 is uh, followed by uh, a bishop takes bishop. I don't know. What level of play would you recommend this opening? I think the Rosolimo is for everyone. It's very easy to learn. It's, um, it's, there, there is some theory involved, but uh, that the same goes for all openings, or most openings, unless you're playing some kind of system. Um, but it will definitely broaden your opening knowledge. And just being able to identify an opening in any given situation after move three, you're like, ah, this is the French, uh, this is the Sicilian, uh, this is the the Scotch or something, is already is already a lot more than a lot of chess players can say for themselves. So I'd say just dabbling in, in a lot of openings in the beginning is a good idea. But um, if you're wanting to play more seriously, it's good to focus on one opening and uh, learn that thoroughly, maybe get a book on that opening or um, go to 
a chess base or just some database that you have and and look at all the games that uh, masters have played in that opening and you'll get a, a broader understanding of it i think Kelvin is on the right track. I think, Kelvin, you have been um, watching these lectures long enough to understand what I mean. Excuse me. And and that's the move. That's the move. Good job. So it looks like YouTube chat took the trophy here. And the move is actually knight to f5. Knight to f5. Crazy looking, right? So it's not knight b5 this time, but knight f5. And the motive behind this move is probably to put pressure on d6 g7 and h6 the wonders of a knight right and the bishop on b2 is putting pressure on g7 as well as well <laughs> easy <laughs> right it's really really crazy right okay so we have knight f5 another fabulous fisher attacking move and that is what i'm reading from the annotations Okay, so the move that black decided to play here is bishop takes b2, bishop takes b2, and uh, I wonder if I should stop and ask you what would you play here with white pieces, I'm very curious, very curious, yeah, giving up two bishops in a game, two bishops in a game is crazy, but okay, I think what Fisher had in mind is just... Uh, Black's position is so weak, considering how powerless the king is, that he could afford to give up both bishops. Knight b2, we're not going back, we're not going backwards. Remember, if you're going to commit to a move like knight f5, you got to go full force, you got to go all the way here. Um, there's no way you can go back. Knight b6 runs into a small problem. That a7 will capture the knight and you can't take on a8 because the bishop is there as well. Nice pawn march destroyer and and screws. I like it, I like it, I like it. Knight takes d6. Good job. Knight takes d6 is the move. And king f8 is pretty much forced here. And uh, now, of course, they've taken our bishop and we're just down those three points. And we have to capture back here on h6. But now the question is, well, great. We're equal in material and stuff. But the bishop is attacking the rook. What happens if they just take the rook? But I think black was a little afraid here. Black was slightly frightened by the possibilities that white has. And black ended up playing this move, f6. Sheer brilliance, exactly. So bishop takes a1 is very interesting and probably good for black. One possible continuation is this line for the move. Bishop takes a1, queen takes a1. Oh, right. Okay, so here... If black played bishop takes a1, white would continue with queen takes a1. And this is a very common idea. I've used it in a game of, of my own, but unintentionally or unknowingly, like the, the bishop is so strong that even sacrificing the exchange is worth it because you get the queen on that diagonal attacking the rook. The rook doesn't have any squares to go to. So white does get the exchange back, maybe even with some interest. So that is a very nice idea there. Queen takes a1, queen takes d6, queen takes h8, king e7 and queen h7. And and that's that's what they wrote there for the the variation. So instead instead of taking the rook, he decides to play f6. He's like, "Fisher, I know your antics. I'm not going to allow you to do any sort of bargaining there for my exchange." On the dark squares, like dies, yeah, yep, exactly, exactly, Eva. Alrighty, so now white decides to play this move, knight d to f7, 
what was the best move? It says that it's completely winning here for white. Why is winning? And the best move? How is that the best move? I'm just looking at the analysis. I cheated a little bit and I looked at the engine and the best move apparently is rook a5. That is too high level for me to understand. Okay, knight, D, knight f7 looks a lot more exciting. Gotta get to work. Oh no, Pawn Watch Destroyer leaving us again. Have a good Twitch stream. Thank you so much, Pawn Watch Destroyer. Nice, Andreas. Nice. The depth of thought and foresight is unbelievable. True, true. All right, so here, Black obviously just decides to exchange queens because what he has in mind here is just if you're exchanging major pieces, it's really going to ease um, the pain that king is under and all the pressure it's under as well. So rook takes naturally and king e7. King e7. And black just concedes this exchange. Um, apologies. Knight takes rook and rook takes h8. And now, whoa. I did not expect that move. But it makes a lot of sense. What's the next move, guys? What's the next move? I will stop. I'm so happy I didn't play it. Rook B1 is not the move. It's another wow move. It's another wow move here. Something you would never expect. Exactly. Yes, not a five again. <laughs> So knight of five, wow, Fishes is taking advantage of black here. And captures, captures. And the idea behind it is, uh, well, if the bishop goes back, there's f4. And if the king moves over one square, let's see what black did here. Bishop actually went back. But if the king goes here, for instance, we're just going to play something like rook d7 and pick up the bishop. It's beautiful. And then king f8, same thing. We're going to go here. King g7, we're going to go check, and we'll actually pick up the rook instead. So, of course, maybe this is just forced. Bishop e5, it's insane. It's insane. Beautiful stuff. You can call me Fisher from now on. Right, screws. Right, Fisher. <laughs> okay. So, after bishop e5, we play f4 and rook c8. There we go. Oh my goodness. Screws is Fisher. You are the fisherman. <laughs> Wait, what? Okay, so now we're going to take the bishop. Rook takes c2. Threatening rook takes g2. Which is a real threat. Wow. And, of course, as we know, e6. Creating that pass pawn. Pass pawns are so important. He doesn't care about the g2 pawn. He doesn't care about the g2 pawn. Because what happens after rook takes g2 here is, well, white can just play king f1 and there's no more problems. Okay, so here he decides to play bishop c6, stopping the bishop, uh, stopping the rook from going to d7 and rook c1. Exchanging rooks. Taking it out on his opponent? Sure. Flipping the board. <laughs> the table. Imagine not resign. It was Boris Spassky. He had pride. But but he also... Okay. Anyway. I really like this. Okay. So, after this, 
he decides to play, let's see, king d6, and then check, king e5, uh, e7. What happens after e7? a5. Menu keeps coming up. a5. Rook c1. Bishop d7. Rook c5 check. Normal endgame stuff. King. Rook takes a5. And it's, it's pretty much over. Look at the power of this e7 pawn. There's just nothing that um, black can do about it. Next thing, white is going to go after the b4 pawn and then the bishop. And it's just over. Pride shattered. Well, to be honest, if uh, what happened in the movie Pawn Sacrifice really happened in real life, then we'd say that um, Boris Basky easily put his pride aside and he got up and, and gave uh, Bobby Fischer round of applause. I don't know if that actually happened or it was just for the th theatrics of the film, but he literally, he in like at the end of the game, stood up and, and gave Bobby Fischer a clap, a well-deserved clap. He's like, you beat the Russians, like welcome to stardom almost. <laughs> <laughs> screws mcscrews taking on both chats i see fish's play is like a work of art i agree with you calvin Alrighty, so that was a really really great game and the next one i want to take a look at is between <laughs> okay I'm just trying to contain myself here. Um, <laughs> is between Peter Svidler and Ralph Mamadov. And in the title of this game, <laughs> it was given a name. <laughs> Svidler on the roof. <laughs> Named after the musical. Fiddler on the Roof. It was given a name. Fiddler on the Roof, but Fiddler on the Roof. <laughs> oh my goodness. Harder, new planty in the house? Exactly, there's two of them now. There's two of them. On the Roof, <laughs> on the Roof. Yeah, it was it was really really funny. Okay. Okay. Anyway, let's continue. So Peter Svidler played white pieces against Ralf Mamadov. Um Oh, the skilling game Deepak, amazing. Amazing. Okay. Let's begin. E4, C5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop b5. And we get the Russell Limo set up. We then have g6 and takes. So this seems to be very, very popular. This game was played, I think, quite recently. Uh, might be wrong. Yeah, it was recent ish. 2010. Only 10 years ago. Goodness, time flies. <clears throat> Whoa, screws. Whoa. Yes, recent compared to like the 1900 games we usually take a look at. I think anything that is um, over, um, well, played in the 2000s or I, I think it's quite recent. While we were still alive. When did this game happen? 2010. 2010. Okay. So this time he decides to take with the deep on in the previous game where um, Fischer played Boris Spassky, uh, he took with the B pawn, so we're seeing something different here. D3, and what I like about D3 in its in its simplicity is that it kind of just soft stops the C4 move. Bishop B7, I mean this will forever be a bit of a problem, but you'll see how white deals with this weakness that black has. 
recent is a bit dated. Oh my goodness. Recently as in primary school. I mean, that was like two years ago or something, right? Just then. Okay, H3, H um, B6 and A3. Simple stuff, A5. So black is going to try really, really hard here to remove the, the weakness that he has here on the queen side. <laughs> Knight c3, what? Okay, what? it makes sense. If he is kind of provoking this bishop takes c3 to uh, mimic the, the weakness that he has, double pawns, double pawns, but I mean, this bishop is just too strong and losing that bishop will be a weakness on its own. e5, an idea we saw in the previous game as well. When Anish got over competitive and lost the day one in the quarters is really sad. He was leading at some points. Maybe just everything got to him. I don't know. I don't know what happened. Was it Anish versus Magnus's first game? Oof. Okay, bishop e3 and knight to e7. Knight to e7. Which is the idea um, that Boris didn't play in that game. He played his bishop out instead. But uh, black obviously knows the importance of king safety here. There's three draws. What is this opening known as? As you see in the title, it's the Rosolimo. Rosolimo, Sicilian Rosolimo. Knight to a4. And here we see the idea uh, behind this weakness. So he creates the weakness on the C file with C6, C5. By putting pressure on those pawns, knight a4 is a perfect way to do that. Already you see the immense pressure on b6 and c5. The bishop is also doing a good job on e3. Now it may not seem as though he's winning a pawn anytime soon, but that knight is pretty much untouchable. And the reason for that is if black at any point does want to play b5 to chase the knight away, c5 is hanging and he can just go ahead and grab that guy. Wouldn't it be fun if you could copyright chess openings so that people would have to pay you to play your openings? No one would play chess anymore. No one would play chess. Or what I think would happen is that they would end up playing a different move order. Or maybe a3 first. Because the thing is, if you transpose into that opening, it's not your fault. It's where the wind blows you. When, where the wind takes you. That's, that's, that's what I meant. Bad move because a knight on the room is very dumb. It's, it's okay. It's justifiable. If you can justify um, a principally bad move, well, justify that, then, then it's fine. <laughs> People have to pay Rebecca to plunder their queens. <laughs> well. Yeah, they played this and Leku explained it. Ah, oh, I see. Okay. What is my rating? Nothing near what, what it should be. Thanks for asking, the cool guy. All right, so knight a4 and rook b8. Rook b8, just <clears throat> adding extra defense to that b6 pawn. Because the thing is, if uh, black loses the pawn on b6, then oh, it's just over for black. Because then he's going to lose c5 and it's just going to fall apart, I think. So here, queen d2, uh, threatening a possible bishop h6 at some point, castling. Black knows the importance of king safety here frode thank you so much it's 9.9 .9 out of 10 on a code on coaches my rating yeah i don't know the, the point one must have just kind of taken a hike at some point i, I don't know what happened there i really don't know 10 out of 10 thank you okay so bishop h6 and f6 okay bishop h6 to get rid of that bishop bishop takes bishop king takes bishop and i'm very interested to know how white proceeds here so can you guys come up with a move this time it's not as wow as i usually you know make it out to be but it is a pretty good move what are you guys thinking Come back with calves for Christmas. He will wrap those calves up and put a bow on it. That's what's going to happen. G4 is very brave. Very brave. 
Castling. Mm -hmm. Castling is very important. But remember when I was talking about the Rose de Lima giving up the bishop for the knight on the queen's side. We're going to try and take advantage of uh, this queen side. And the reason white decides to not castle yet is because of the static pawn structure in the center. If the center was completely open, or maybe there was a rook um, on the on the e-file, then white would strongly consider castling here. But what do I mean by static pawn structure? Is these pawns over here. They're not going forward or they're not being captured anytime soon. There's no tension in the center and they're pretty much just tied down by the pawn chain that they're that that's there right now and uh, if there was any tension in the center white would feel inclined to get the king safe but right now it's just kind of dead air in the center and the king is fine king is fine because apparently knights on the room are fine now they're not fine now that's not how we do things here and uh how am I not seeing the, the move in the chat? Not knight h4, because two knights on the room is just taking it too far. Taking it too far. You gotta you gotta pace yourself. You gotta know when it's good, you gotta know when it's not good. So screws keep that in mind. Chess is is more complicated than you may think here, yeah, screws. C4 is interesting, I like it. So the move that he decided to play here is actually b4. B4. Just putting um all the pressure on the queen side right now. B4, great stuff, guys. Great stuff. You guys are seeing it. Nice. Everyone's getting it. I like it. There we go. So B4. Uh, C takes B4. A takes B4. A takes. Queen takes. And suddenly we see the pressure is now on B6 and C6. Move either pawn and the other becomes very, very weak. Um, and we're still seeing that the white king is, is absolutely fine. Okay, maybe he would want to get the king safe now. Um, it's a little bit less protected than it was before and here after bishop e6 uh, he castles there we go he castles king e2 that would just be very very brave sorry having lag kappa okay bobby fisher or should i say fiddler on the roof rook b2 uh, rook b1 probably okay c5 he decides to push upon but here the weakness is now on b6 and we're going to tar target that square. See, there's no more beef. There's no b5 here in the position because c5 is hanging. Okay, queen c7. And I believe we're just going to put pressure on, on that square. Oh, this one is very nice. So what he's identified here is the knight on the room is dumb. And this move has so many layers to it. Number one, the knight is now threatening knight b5. Number two. The knight had no use on a4 anymore because it wasn't attacking c5. Now black could safely play b5 and the pawn on c5 is protected by the queen. Number three, the rook is controlling the open file. And number four, that knight was never to last on the edge of the board. So repositioning a piece, least active piece to the most active square, he's identified this. And I really, really like how powerful this move is. Really, really nice. Meeting over. Welcome back, Happy. Peter played this as a main opening 40 years ago now. It's in the Vogue. <laughs> it's in Vogue. Oh, okay. Okay, so knight to, to c3 and knight c6, knight b5. Stopping that pawn from ever in his life deciding to move forward and that's a very nice outpost for white as well an outpost is a square usually either in the center or your opponent's territory or just like a well-situated square um, that can be controlled by a piece and not attacked by any pawn and black cannot attack that square or the knight or the pawn and it's well backed up the queen has to move over to d7 and rook a6 look at that threatening double up the rooks Putting pressure on b6, it's beautiful. Rook f7, just controlling the 7th rank. And rook a1. And we're loving white's chances here. So knight to b4, seeking an outpost. C c3 is not, a, is not really an option here because d3 would be hanging. So black has taken a very nice advantage of that b4 square. But not really putting pressure on as many squares as he did prior to that. Whoa! I did not expect that move. To be honest, 
I would have stopped if I knew something bad drastic was about to happen. Knight takes e5. Knight takes e5. Wow. Wow. Ayach Knight. Okay, knight takes e5. Pawn takes e5. Queen takes e5. King h6. Oh my goodness. I love this. The whole point of this is what? What was the point of this move, guys? Believe it or not, he does not capture the rook on b8. But instead plays rook a7. Why didn't he take it? Oh, because the, the rook is also being attacked by the knight on, a, on b4. I thought queen takes b8 is the best move here. I also thought so. But here, I think it is, because it's slightly better for black. Now it's better for black. What happened? What is going on? I'm so confused. Okay, central, control, outpost. Knight takes b6. Okay, it's equal, equal, okay. Rook a5. Engine is going wild. Every move is just crazy here. A whole piece versus four pawns. Wow, what is going on? My brain is fried. I know, mine too. Mine too. The king is not safe anymore. He traded queens. He traded queens. He didn't go after the king. This is some high level chess. Maybe we should just uh, message Peter and say, Peter, what were you thinking? Please explain this to me. I don't understand. I just don't understand. King g7. King f4. Look at the king activity here, guys. King activeness is important. <laughs> Rook to c1. d4. Rook c2. B, g4. I'm just going to be running through the rest of this because we're actually here to learn some openings. He gives a pawn. It's fine. Look how active that king is. And threatening checkmate. Oh my goodness, he's going. Look at that. Oh! <gasps> Oh my gosh, I love this. So what are we meant to learn from this game? We're meant to learn the opening. We're meant to learn the opening. That's what we're here to learn. But you're also meant to, to learn the power. So the thing is, analyzing games screws and everyone else. It's important to note. The opening, first of all. So we have to focus on the topic at hand. So that'd be the Rosa Lima. But then also going through other parts of the game, maybe there are some moments where you have questions and we can kind of focus on that as well. Different concepts, when it's okay to, to break a rule, when it's uh, or how to follow up on a principle. So it's like, okay, you're controlling the square, but what are you supposed to do after that? And just going from that point. Um, but the rest of the game is just like so mind-boggling like end games is like what is going on because over here we saw some four pawn compensation for the bishop but how to proceed king to the center rook activity there's no time to defend it's okay to give up pawns if you're going to end up with a pass pawn maybe that's going to reach the other side of the board in time so poor mike getting beaten i'm sorry sorry got really excited <laughs> good pawn structure strong pawns too much too many pawns i mean it's enough to win look at that two pawns in the seventh rank and it's over and it's over hopefully it wasn't too overwhelming yeah i quite like that okay so now i want to show you guys something this was a game played in 2017 2017 between myself and a player named Shruk Wafa. I was 18.23, my opponent's 21.65, and uh, this was the African Championship. I was doing rather well, I think I had like four and a half out of six or something. I was doing really, really well. 
It's the game. Is where you get you got your title? No. I got my first WGM norm from this tournament, actually. My first WGM norm. She's actually WGM. I I played and I Whoa, I won against uh, two WGMs in that tournament. Uh one top rated player in Africa and then her. Because the thing is I've played her many, many times. It's just never had the results that I've wanted against her. I think I've lost against her three times and beaten her once. WG has a nice a Jersey game. <laughs> yeah. I never really show you my games. I will tell you my thoughts. Um it was three years ago, so I will try to remember as much as possible. Um what I do remember uh from this game is that a lot of the time I would be shaking during a game, maybe getting a little bit too nervous, I would stand up. And luckily there was a door uh, on either side of the hall, one leading to a balcony where you could get some fresh air and just kind of look over, but it was incredibly warm. The tournament was played in uh, Oran, Algeria, and um, uh, the other door led to the bathroom or the other hall, and that was just, okay, I will maybe stop by the bathroom or something, just get some alone time, just like sit and like think or something, I don't know, or most of the time you'll find me on the balcony if I'm too scared or too nervous, maybe there'll be one or other uh, two, uh, I don't know, other players standing there or an arbiter. Um. <laughs> 14 words. Uh, do I offer online coaching? I do. I offer online coaching. If you go to coaches.com, you'll see the bottom of the screen right now. Um, there are different labels such as premium coach and coaches.com and also trust 24 and coaches um so coaches is the platform i coach on and this is uh, one of the training sessions or kind of lectures that i give uh, for coaches am i allowed to talk to other players i can but uh, they they're all so serious at that tournament that like you you won't really find players talking to each other during a game they're just too serious I think that's what's so overwhelming because you kind of, you want to talk, but you can't. And also what was really nice, the the better I was doing at the tournament, the more people came up to me and spoke to me. They're like, I really liked your game yesterday against so-and-so. And you realize that um, the better you become at chess, the more respect you gain around you. So even the people you kind of look up to end up speaking to you because they they have this newfound respect for you. like wow your chess has really you know gotten better or like your game was really awesome to look at and i love that because one of the main reasons i play chess is because of the the kind of respect you can gain from from other players and people and i love how even really strong juniors like who are 12 years old I get approached by maybe a grandmaster who is in their 30s or 40s and they address them as equals and it's amazing because it's like well your play is just so great that I'm going to speak to you as though you're the same age as me almost I really like that <laughs> yeah on discussing their current games then I guess you just gotta trust but you can never really know just like there's a lot of you know, chances for people to, to cheat OTB and cheating online as well. Like, it's 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 impossible to keep an eye on 24-7 unless you keep a wire on them or something, but there's no point. Who's my current favorite chess player? Ooh. It's a good question. I'll get back to that. I'll get back to that. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. So let's begin. I was playing white pieces here. e4, c5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop b5. Rosso Limo. And the wild thing about this tournament is on my way to the tournament, my phone got snatched. And it was at the airport, Dubai airport, and my phone just disappeared. It was right next to me, and it just. Because there were so many people at that terminal 
like, we were just kind of passing and while I was packing my bag my phone was next to me next thing it was gone um I ended up going to that tournament with having nothing to distract me and the only thing I could really do was crack open my laptop and prepare I had maybe the tv that was on but a language I wasn't able to it was Arabic or French or something like that I wasn't able to understand so I had that in the background maybe some music that I had the wi-fi was very poor in my room so I had chess base open majority of the time and I was playing through different and to be honest that could have been the best thing has ever ever happened to me because I had nothing to distract me in every single game I went in super prepared I had no training I had no coach to help me prepare it was just me and the chessboard and I was doing that like many many hours in the day a lot of the meals I had were either with uh, teammates from the same country as me but we weren't very close so sometimes I even ate alone so just being alone with my thoughts and being alone with chess is it's a new experience. I felt very lonely, but I also felt like that was the best chess uh, performance I've ever had in my life. And I don't know if I'll be able to replicate it, but perhaps if I didn't, if I don't have as many distractions as I usually do, I could perform at a similar, you know, level as I did. Anyway, so I went into this game really prepared and I played bishop b5. Why don't you leave your phone at home when you go to tournaments from now on? Because I take photos with my phone and I communicate with my family or my friends and so on. Why? No, screws. Okay, so we have g6 on the board. I castled. I did not. I did not take on on c6. The reason for that is because usually, um, if I get my rook to e1 in time, I could often just bring my bishop back to f1 and reposition my bishop that way because I wanted to keep my bishop for later. Um, so after bishop g7, c3, probably rook e1 was slightly better, but I got this anyway. D6 and d4. So um, I must have changed my theory a couple years ago than uh, to what I'm playing now but maybe just wanted to get the d4 in much sooner okay so the pressure on the king is no longer really overwhelming and I had a lot going through my mind here there was a new concept I learned three maybe a couple weeks before the tournament and that was kind of deciding or deciphering when your bishop is good and when your bishop is bad and that helped me in the very first game of the tournament against uh, Mona Khaled. And also this game where I used a lot of my time and ended up in time trouble both, both games. Hi, hey, jam it again. Doesn't sound realistic. Sure, taking notes. Okay, so knight c3 knight f6 and uh, h3 h3 just some kind of prophylactic move in case of bishop g4 later on and just kind of stopping that castles and bishop g5 so here what my main focus was was developing the pieces i knew that in any situation where my opponent had the opportunity to take advantage of a mistake that i've made or maybe my lack of development she would jump straight onto that and uh, never let go so the thing is i had to make sure that i had to keep it three s's simple solid and satisfying something that looked really good so my pieces are well developed looks like i have the central control um everything is great right now it's simple because i'm not trying anything fancy i'm not trying to put my piece um where it's tacked or maybe like try to be uh oh this looks so smart i'm gonna do this and uh, solid you got to keep things protected at all times as you can see my bishops are protected my pawns are protected um everything's good something where you could look at the position and say well this isn't too complicated it looks very normal um and i would play for either side here h6 normal stuff bring the bishop back to e3 so this also is another reason i played a h3 is because if i play bishop g5 and h6 is played um, I can bring my bishop back to e3, not worrying about knight to g4. Um, and now my bishop is pretty much safe on e3. And I wanted to provoke this h6 move 
because now I can play queen d2 and target the h6 pawn. So another thing in chess goes is sometimes when you don't spot any weaknesses in your opponent's position, so maybe they're keeping things really solid, you want to provoke weaknesses, you want to create them yourself. Um, so sometimes you kind of have to tease your opponent and saying, okay, play it if you want. I mean, you're going to be attacking me, I can bring it back, but that will be my next target. And once you've created one weakness, it's always a good idea to create one more so that you have the principle of two weaknesses. So if you don't know what the principle of two weaknesses is, I definitely recommend that you go ahead and you Google that uh, just to take a look. Um, the principle of, two, principle of two weaknesses in chess. Very important because maybe you can go ahead and attack one, distract your opponent and go for the other and so on. Okay, so here we have bishop to e3 a6 and bishop takes a uh, bishop takes e6 and why did i decide to take the knight in this position why did i decide i didn't want to bring the bishop back to a4 and c2 or um what was the reasoning behind this move and it was such an important move to think about as well because as soon as you exchange a piece and it's something that i discussed in the master class as well um as soon as you exchange a piece you have to evaluate who it's going to be better for is that exchange going to be good for you is it going to be good for your opponent and why so like i mentioned just before this i said uh, what i had learned recently well way before or just before the tournament is when is a good when is bishop good for you when is it bad for you so it's good to think about the pawns or look at the pawns if i exchange the knight and the bishop captures back and i push this pawn i have now created a static pawn structure Right in this position, it is not static because either pawn can move forward, you can put pressure in the center and it can be completely blown open. And uh, if the position is open, it would be better for the two bishops. And uh, if your bishop is on a dark square and your, your static pawns are on light squares, it makes that dark squared bishop stronger. That is why after exchanging here, I play d5. So it makes my dark squared bishop stronger, it has more range, and it makes their light squared bishop, okay, their light squared bishop is actually their stronger bishop, and their dark, am I lying right now? No, I'm not. And their dark squared bishop is bad for them because their pawns are on dark squares, which may future be um, a problem for black. So basically what I'm trying to say, I'm gonna go back, take a step back and just try to explain this properly. If you are playing white and your static pawns are on light squares, that makes your dark squared bishop better, light squared bishop weaker. And the opposite is true for black, or the same is true for black here. So if their pawns are on dark squares, their light squared bishop is stronger, dark squared bishop is weaker. So it, it's kind of opposite in the way that my dark squared bishop is strong for me, and their dark squared bishop is weak for them, if that makes any sense. Hey, Sarah. <laughs> so basically, only the D and E pawns are to be compared for this exercise. Exactly. Because that is the only uh, situation or kind of only point in the position where the pawns are static. And this only applies to static pawns. What are static pawns? Static pawns are those that cannot move forward anytime soon unless of course e6 is being played which is probably something that black will think about at some point because they have the two bishops and uh yeah it's just something to consider here i confused you to the point of a seizure i'm sorry don't don't say that <laughs> can you just take with a pawn you can take with a pawn Oh, she can take with a pawn, yes. She could take with a pawn. But the thing here is now I'm not going to play d5. I'm not going to play d5. And a6 is a weakness. Probably she was thinking about this, kind of saying, well, and I, I feel like I'm a little bit better as well. White is slightly better in this position. And also there's a bunch of other things I can I can start to consider. So take a look. Um, instead, I can put pressure on the c6 pawn with rook c1 and then go ahead and just... A pal pressure on the c file because now c6 is a weakness h6 is a weakness and like i said principle of two weaknesses here exactly okay 
But like I said, it changes the whole dynamic of the position. And I kind of assumed that she would take with the bishop because at a lot of the games that I looked um, at that she's played, she took with the bishop. Okay. So let us try to get through the game before... Okay, we've already run out of time, but I'm going to go over. Okay, bishop to d7 and queen d2, putting pressure on h6, like I said. King h7 and rook d1. Rook d1 is kind of a nonsense move here. Maybe it's something that it wasn't really uh, beneficial for the position because d5 isn't going anywhere. But I think the reasoning behind this move is that in case of e6... So I was thinking of ways she could open up the position and e6 after takes, uh, bishop takes and queen takes d6. But of course, black is never going to play e6. Uh, rook c8 and queen to d3. Why did I play queen d3? Well, let me try and see. <laughs> um, so the reason behind queen d3 is probably to plan... Okay, first of all, I'm in line with the king. Maybe just kind of this indirect pressure. But let's see uh, what happens after a couple of moves here. A4, B4. And now I felt like, okay, I'm putting pressure on A6. My knight could be redirected to A2, threatening the pawn. If the pawn wants to move forward, I can just capture with the queen. But also, it it's putting pressure, right? So, and if A5, I could simply play uh, a move... Let's see, let's see. Maybe I could try to reason with myself here. Knight b1? Why didn't I play knight b2? Is knight b2 better? Oh no, this is bad. Wow. Trying to reason with myself is difficult. This is very difficult. <laughs> okay. Say so 14 words again. Four what? I don't understand. Nonsense move. <laughs> Who's this game against? It's uh, my own game versus uh, Shriek Wafa. <laughs> That's how it is. Really? Okay, queen to a5. Knight to d2. And I wanted to play knight c4 here. Bishop takes a4. And this is completely fine. I get the pawn back. So knight to d4. And my plan here is to play knight to b3. So just putting pressure... On the queen side here, all majority of my pieces on the queen side. If you cut the board in half, you'll see majority of my pieces on that side. Queen to b3, and I get the pawn back. So knight takes, pawn takes, rook c1. Probably better to just capture the pawn immediately, but I played rook c1. And uh, she could simply just take the rook, but she didn't. Okay, queen b7, and queen takes b4. Queen takes b4. Okay, rook takes, rook takes, rook a8. Now we're both controlling an open file. Things are good. I'm attacking b5. I have a very strong bishop. And if you look at the static pawn structure once again, my bishop is strong compared to her bishop that's on g7. So I have the better bishop and I felt like I was already better, even if the position is completely equal. Okay, so b3, rook to b2. Of course, um, she's going to control the second rank over here. King h2, just for safety purposes and uh, preventative measures but now we're both in time trouble this is a position where we're both in time trouble and uh, rook a6 and things get a little crazy after this so i take uh the pawn she takes the pawn on e4 we're still equal five pawns each maybe i'm a little bit uh worse off because of the number of pawn um islands that i have i have three pawn islands one on b3 one on d5, and uh, one over here, f2, g2, h3. And she has one pawn island, which is all connected pawns. Pawn islands are separated by open files, so just something to keep in mind there. So knight to e4, and rook to c7. She protects with bishop f6, but now things get a little bit crazy. So I play rook to c4, and she plays rook to a5 rook to a5 so i'm attacking the rook she's trying to be fancy rook takes b5 and then my pawn is hanging there's no way to defend it so i play knight c7 okay i'm still attacking the knight knight moves but now i do something i do something 
and the move that I play is bishop d2. And she's going crazy. Like, she's thinking, oh my goodness, did I just lose a piece? If I move the knight, I lose the rook. If I don't move the knight, what happens? So there's a way for black to stop this. Can you find a way out for black? Can you find a way out for black? It's still equal, still completely equal. You have a passer. There we go. I have an outside passer. What is a pawn island? A pawn island is a group of pawns separated by open files, Sarah. Open files. What is an open file? Open file is a line, a vertical line on the board that has no pawns on it. So here he has a pawn. No pawns here, no pawns here. And what I mean by pawns, uh, I'm just talking about white pawns now. Uh, he has a pawn. There's a pawn uh, island on the D file. No pawns over here separated and here's one pawn island as well exactly rook c5 rook c5 um and it's it's safe because if i take 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 and we're equal completely equal and she misses this move she plays bishop check and uh this move in itself loses the game immediately. I play f4 and I pick up both pieces. Both pieces. Two pieces up is enough to win. But it was a big wow moment. We're both in time trouble. And I mean, this rook c5 move is, is probably easy to see when you're just given the position without the added pressure of having played already three, four hours. Um, but it's like a big wow yeah so i got really lucky there in that position but just being able to see that rosalimo um i'm i'm very i was very excited to have uh, or have the opportunity to share that with you and uh, yeah i think that's a beautiful end to a, a great lecture i hope you guys learned something today and uh, it's always fun talking to you spending some time with you guys and uh, i'll see you again next week i'll see you again next week but just keep in mind guys if you want to participate in our master classes master classes are something it's it's like this only it's a little bit more private it's about i think uh, in the previous weeks we've uh, charged six dollars for an hour which is absolutely uh, nothing compared to the amount of time we, we spend together so uh, six dollars for an hour if you go to coachess.com you'll find all the information there um, you also get to see the different uh, coaches and and what they can offer so uh, do go check that out and uh, I'll see you guys really, really soon. Bye. <laughs>